feel free to use the chat box to share your questions, your comments, and your suggestions. And as always, this um, webinar will be followed by a quiz. You have to submit that quiz, which is an ungraded quiz, just in order to, you know, have your own practice. And, you know, uh, you just have to fill um, your, um, your, uh, your quiz just to get your uh, get your you know certificate email to write uh, directly right in front of you so it will be so easy and handy for everyone to get their certificate which is personalized and also with the stamp of the news so again uh, welcome everyone and please feel free to use the chat box to share your question and your comments and where are you from and we will uh, all take up all the questions and comments for the uh, by the end of this session and I'm so happy to meet you all virtually and hopefully we will be able to you know keep up meeting like this it's so happy so wonderful to have this opportunity of seeing everyone um uh, in the zoom meeting no matter if it is a virtual meeting so please feel free to use the chat box to use your to send your questions and your comments and also please join the news um um you know facebook and um, the, the website that we have and uh, you know everything that uh, we are offering free of cost there are so many projects of the news that you might that might be of your interest and you like to join in so please feel free to um to visit our website and to join our whatsapp group and um, again uh, the webinar will be starting in 12 minutes from now thank you very much i'm sharing a few links for you to no join. Hello, sir. Professor Martin is here. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello, sir. Hello. Welcome. Hello, hello. Hello, sir. Welcome. So happy to see, see you here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for invitation. <laughs> thank you so much. Honor and pleasure is all mine, sir. Thank you so much for joining today. Sir, uh, we cannot actually, unfortunately, see you. Uh, I think you're... Uh, uh, exactly. Okay, okay, okay. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for joining us today, sir. Hello, camera. Hello, sir. So good to see you, sir. Um, I had the privilege of uh, learning from you during the Axmint courses by the EC, uh, by the Axmint, uh, you know, society. It was a huge privilege, and I, I, I can just very well relate to your wonderful, impeccable teaching skills. Uh huh. Thank you, thank you. It's ni nice, nice new for me. So you. You visited X-Men the last year or when? when? Sir, I was in the, in 4.1, X-Men 4.1. Uh-huh, 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 okay, yeah, okay. Uh -huh. Exactly, sir. So I, I just completed the X-Men court and, you know, I have, uh, now have the ATC, Development Stroke Intervention. Yeah, great. It so could so we could we now uh, try my presentation? Yes, please, sure, sir. So I should do the share screen, okay? Exactly, sir. Share screen, and I will put this one, and now you can see. Is okay? Oh, uh, unfortunately, we cannot see your slides now, sir. Right now, you cannot see. Yes, sir. Because I have the presentation here on my computer. And this, you can share. And um, no, sir, we we can. So, should I do some special trick how to share the? Sir, so do you have an Apple? You do you have a Mac? No. It's just Windows, simple. Yeah, I have a Mac, I have a Windows two HP right now. Uh, so, sir, I think it's um. Are you can you see the green button? The share screen button is it green? Green, share, share the screen, okay. Yes, sir. Share the screen.
Mm, no, sir. Still, no. Yeah, yes, we can see now, sir. Uh, we can see your exactly. Yes, exactly, sir. We can see it now very perfectly. You you can see my my video uh, my presentation. Exactly, sir. We can very perfectly see it. Okay, so now I try the video if it's okay. Video is okay. Exactly, sir. So perfect. Everything is perfect, sir. Good. So we are ready. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> thank you so much, sir. Sir, again, thank you so much from sparing your uh, time, your very precious time from your very busy schedule. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. And course. I think it's a very, very important topic, sir. Thank you very much for sharing your knowledge with us because being a young neurosurgeon myself, I can think that it is a huge, huge privilege. It's like a dream come true for us. It's so surreal to have this very um, huge privilege of having this opportunity from learning, of learning from bastards like you. So again, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, sir, we do have seven minutes um, uh, for the lecture. And how, how is it been discussion? The, the people can discuss any time any time, any moment, it's it's possible. They yes. can discuss. Yeah. <laughs> So the chat box will be open throughout the meeting and we will take up the questions by the end of the session as uh, if you... Aha, in the end. Any, in no, the end. not during the... Okay, so. Yeah. And I have a topic maybe for one hour. It's uh, too much or... No, no. Short? No? No. No, no, sir. Sir, we um, here, you know, most of the time, the most of the attendees are uh, at the consultant level or the training level um, attendees, and they are all very, very much uh, excited all the time and very much keen to listen to uh, lectures from masters like you, because, you know, it means a lot to us. So we are all ears. We'll find us so much eager to learn from you. So please take your time as much as you like. Okay, okay. And this is your activity, your personal activity, or it's... Um uh this this project it's it's your uh yes sir sir i run the news uh neurosurgery enthusiastic women society and i'm also a member of the education committee of the wfns and the ispn and also work for nas and uh there oh, are yeah. <laughs> so actually uh, i do so many things with so many different associations and also for my own and also work for the harvard women empowerment association harvard i'm a harvard alumnus myself so uh, i do all these programs i'm also so much keen to collaborate and to do my own thing and uh, uh, all the free projects, whatever I do my, on my own, it's totally for free and uh, without any sponsorship and uh, etc. So it's like uh, basically my own passion because when I was uh, a trainee myself, I've completed my training. But when I was a trainee myself, I just figured out that we need a lot. We need to learn a lot, especially when um, uh, you are from uh, a country, a developing country, like I'm a Pakistani. So my training is from Pakistan. And I've, although I've uh -huh. worked in the largest public sector unit, but- I, I just... know now you are based in US or where are you working now? Currently, I'm in, I'm in Pakistan right now, but I just keep on roaming. I'm currently in my hometown. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. Good, good. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. So it's, uh, it's a pleasure. And, um, uh, you know, I had a, a lot of interest in stroke intervention and intervention because I think it is the new thing that every neurosurgeon should be well equipped with. So again, thank you so much for joining in. Hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Sir, I think that people will keep on joining us. So uh, I guess if you wish to start now, we can just start now. We, we could be, people will start, uh, keep on joining us during the webinar. And there are also viewers on neurosurgical.tv and on the on the YouTube channel as well. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. And, uh, and this uh, is available on the YouTube also? or YouTube, yes, sir. It's it's available. It will. It's still. It's live on YouTube channel on my YouTube channel and on Neurosurgical TV run by uh, John Bennett. Oh yeah, excellent. Thank you, sir. Right. Sir, if you uh, wish to, uh, I think because I know you are you are very busy, uh, very busy professor. So I I believe that we should not waste your very precious time. So if you wish to jo to start the lecture, please feel free to. We can start at at four exactly. If people know the time, I think it's better to start exactly. Okay. Yeah, thank you so thank you so much, sir. Yes.
I'll just uh, keep on uh, um, informing everyone. Actually, I run a WhatsApp group as well. So people just keep on uh, getting updates. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sir, I, I missed the WFNS meeting this town in Cape Town. I would have a privilege of meeting you during the meeting. I saw uh, your lecture and your participation in the WFNS yeah, 2023. Writing this topic is much more, um, this, the topic of stroke intervention is much more important now since we have got the COVID-19 with us and the COVID-19, you know, has uh, <laughs> fairly increased, uh, you know, it's in unfortunate happening that it has increased the risk of strokes. Sir, I believe the stroke intervention is more important today than uh, it was ever before uh, COVID-19 hit us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fine. Uh, sir, uh, actually, uh, I think everyone knows about you so well, but I would love, I, I would like to have the honor of uh, sharing uh, a few, uh, um, you know, words of your kind introduction. So I, I think um, um, if you like, I can just proceed with the, with the, with the webinar. If you say, I, may I commence the program? Can everyone hear us? Hello? Yes, yes. Uh, actually, somebody has written that they are not. I can hear you. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, I would like to say uh, just a few words of your introduction. I, uh, actually, everyone knows about you so well. But it for, the, uh, for, uh, for the sake of formality, I would like to say um, a few words of your introduction uh, before we start the webinar. So again, uh, everyone, welcome to this uh, webinar by the news. And it's an honor to welcome you all. And most of it, uh, most of all, it's a big honor to have the privilege of hosting Professor Martin Samies uh, for the news webinar series. Professor Martin is, um, Professor Martin Samies is a professor and chairman of Department of Neurosurgery at Masaryk Hospital, University uh, J.E. Perkinji, and also 
at Second Medical Faculty of the Charles University. He completed his MD degree in 1988 with honors and his um, in his work afterwards, his experience grew, especially through special training and courses on the international level. His clinical work can be divided into neurovascular programs, where he's the vice chairman of the Neurovascular Center focused on surgery and endovascular treatment of the cerebral aneurysms, avians, and also in cerebral ischemia. And um, he's also had the skull-based program started in 2004, uh, his uh, 2004 establishment of the Clinical and Educational Skill Based Center and the Center for the Facial Nerve Surgery, which is the WFNS Education Center Class A, and his experimental work can also be divided into cranial and peripheral nerve regeneration, anatomical skill based dissections, and since 1999, Institution of Anatomical Skill Based Laboratory in the first in the Czech Republic in Czechia. Um, he's a member of various societies, for some of which he's also serving as the president. He also engaged in editorial positions of various publications, in being a part, member of their editorial board. And altogether, Professor Samuels has a productive author with over 150 publications, including papers, articles, monographs, books, chapters. And um, throughout his career, he has held about 135 invited speeches and is so much active in um, conducting workshops and courses all over the world, for which we know him very nicely and also I'm a huge fan of your old papers and your lectures so it was a privilege to have to um, have uh, learned from you during the ASMIN programs and everything so basically it's a matter of huge honor for me to welcome you sir um, to the new webinar series so thank you very very much sir for sparing your precious time from your very busy schedule we know that um, um, you're so busy but it's your dedication which we really appreciate so the floor is all yours now thank you Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, let's go for the uh, program, which uh, it's called the Surgery for Stroke Prevention. I think it's not very popular in many departments of neurosurgery because the majority of these cases are doing by vascular surgeon. But I try to show you that it's a very good program for neurosurgery and show you why neurosurgeons should be more active and overtake this, this field from the vascular surgeons. So key for this for this topic is the carotid and arterectomy. You you know we operate the asymptomatic stenosis, which is now more conservative, but very important uh, role is a carotid surgery for symptomatic stenosis after TIA or after a small stroke. And um, very very new topic is a carotid surgery after thrombectomy. You know that every country is developing now the new program of the thrombectomy. Uh, if you see the patient with the stenosis of the carotid, so I show you new indications and the very good argument that this is neurosurgical topic, definitely. The second point, there is an indication of the bypass for hemodynamic ischemia. It's a very controversial topic, but I show you that the study COS and study CM COS now from China are very, very, uh, I think, not describing the reality and uh, show you that this patient does exist and we should indicate them for operation. And the last topic is a vertebral basilar ischemia, uh, which is also very important. Not so many patients does exist, but we have very elegant methods for, for revascularization. So this program brings uh, entire, entire uh, program, which uh, in my department, carotid surgery, it's about 150, 150 procedures per year. A bypass about 10, 15, and vertebral basal ischemia about one, two cases per year. So it's, I think it's very good program. So let's start with the, the, the key for this topic, which is carotid enterectomy. I show you first uh, how to do this. Not many, many numbers, but show you how we thinking about these patients and how we indicate and how we operate them. So first case, since typical case, uh, 62 years old male, with repeated TIA, and uh, he came to a neurologist after one month. Usually the patients should come to emergency the same day, but this was very, very lazy patients, irresponsible. So uh, after one month, the neurologist, neurologist made the CT angio. You can see significant, significant stenosis, right carotid, which is responsible for this uh, TIA. Uh, so we see these patients usually the same day from the neurologist. And uh, what do we see? We see the neurological status. Now he was without any neurological deficit. 
but we see the symptomatic stenosis of the right carotid. What we can uh, describe, this is severe stenosis, 90%, which is indication for active approach, stent or surgery. In this case, young patients, good accessible stenosis because the, the bifurcation and the distal end of the plaque is in the level C4. So it's a very good accessible for surgery. If there is a C2, this is the limit of our accessibility. So this uh, bifurcation is a good level, symptomatic patients, so we uh, consider surgery. Uh, the principle of the carotid surgery is close the carotid for 30 minutes. So we study before the indication also the collateralization. You see nice A comb, nice P comb. So we have a presumption that the carotid surgery will be without intraluminal shunt because the patient has a sufficient collateral flow. And we presume that this surgery will be without this shunt. We use shunt only selectively for patients who need this. We always do before surgery the diffusion MRI to see how big is the necrosis, how big is uh, the, 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 the necrosis in the brain. This patient has only TIA, so very small vessels. It's not visible here, so diffusion is uh, clear without any territorial infarct. And we uh, indicate this patient for surgery, how I say the same day. Here is indication criteria. So symptomatic stenosis, 50 and more percent is indicated for surgery or stent. But your department should have morbid mortality, 6%. If you have more than 6% of the major stroke or mortality, so this surgery is not, uh, uh, not uh, adjustable to do because because you should be less than 6% to make sense for, for the patients. And now uh, stent or surgery. So we have uh, many studies about this topic and all results are similar. similar. So, so uh, I think it's comparable results, but still carotid surgery has a little bit better results. So we uh, consider surgery, carotid surgery as a primary, primary uh, therapeutic tool especially in the young patients, in the ulcerous stenosis, severe stenosis like this. Calcification also. Calcification, it's not good for stenting because the radial power of the stent, it's not so powerful. So calcification is indication also for surgery. And all primary stenosis we should consider for surgery. In the team should be always endovascular team as everywhere. So we use the stenting usually in the very sick patients, if the anatomy is a bad and a bifurcation is very high, or is there is some scaring about the neck, if there is some, uh, some radiation after radiation or after surgery. And a very important point, restenosis. So restenosis of the carotid, it's better stand than do re-surgery. Re so this is our considering. And for these patients, definitely we selected the, the surgery. Here is the limit of the highest position of the stenosis. It's a mastoid process and angle of the mandible. So mastoid mandibular line. Uh, if distal end of the stenosis is uh, higher than this limit, so we should also uh, indicate standing because uh, during the surgery, you should be sure that you are safely, you safely access the distal end of the plaque and you can see the healthy lumen of the vessel, which is very, very important. And now some uh, special things about the timing. So we know from literature that we should do surgery within two weeks. I already told that we do this the same day on the next day. So we have very, very, very uh, acute approach. And uh, anesthesia, you can use a deep uh, cervical block or general anesthesia. We prefer deep uh, cervical block. So it's a wake surgery and it's very good that we can test the patient after testing of the clamping of the carotid and you can test the patient how is the collateralization at the brain. And if the collateral is okay, the patient is without any deficit, we can operate without a shunt. So using the shunt is very important decision-making. So we test the patient and if there is during the one minute no neurological deficit, we are sure in the invade patient that the collateralization is a good and that the, for the 30 minutes that the, the, this hemisphere is a, it's good blood flow through the collateralization. 
If not, if the patient fall in conscious, in conscious on hemiparesis, we use this intraluminal shunt, and during the surgery, when we remove the plaque, the, the flow is preserved, preserved on this intraluminal shunt. But you will see later that using this shunt bring higher risk of the embolization. It's a log logic because you manipulate inside the vessel and sometimes about 30% you can see on the diffusion that there is some, some emboli uh, during the surgery. So how we do the surgery? Uh, we do the uh, awake surgery. The patient uh, has uh, this toy squeeze uh, with uh, the noise. So we know that the movement is okay and we speak with the patients. So, so, so we control the neurological status after, after clamping the carotid. And um, we we this decide about the using shunt or not. So next point is very important: uh, antiplatelet therapy. So the patient should be on the ASA aspirin, clopidogrel or dual antiagregation is acceptable only for symptomatic patients. For asymptomatic stenosis, we wait because there is no rush, and we wait one week and we operate only ASA. But symptomatic patient, if there is dual antiagregation, we operate because there is the risk of the uh, recurrent stroke. But our neurologists, they know our approach, so they send the patient the same day and they put only aspirin if there is not in the patients and uh, they do not start the dual anti-aggregation because we have a uh, less hematoma in the, in the wound. Anticoagulation, very important. Now we use uh, the same dose for all patients, 5,000 heparin. We know use the protamine because during the one hour and one hour and a half surgery, the heparin half time, it's exactly like this. So after one hour, we see the half of the of the of the uh, of the heparin inside the level. We, we test the co coagulation time during the surgery. So I think very easy. Five thousand unit heparin before before clamping the carotid, and that's all. So uh, positioning very important elevation of the head because we need uh, venous drainage and the gravity helps us. Uh, very important is the rotate the neck because most important uh, marker is an uh, anterior aspect of the sternocleid muscle. And in this line, we start the preparation. We should, uh, uh, we should know also about the level of the C4 because we know that the bifurcation here, here is a C4. So we know that the cartilage uh, has a... Uh, superior border is uh, exactly on the C4, so we uh, we uh, plan the the incision and we know exactly where the bifurcation is. And um, uh, very important, this awake surgery. We use awake surgery. It's many invasive approach because we have no intubation, no general anesthesia. The patient doesn't interrupt the parallel medication, and after surgery. The patient is absolutely okay. He can receive the uh, drinking, uh, eating. So I think it's it's very comfortable for the patients. And the most important point, we see the patient's neurological status after clumping of the carotid. And if there is any deficit, we use a shunt, but the shunt needs about 10% patients. Only 10% patients have no collateralization. So this method, it's very, very appropriate, very precise. And if uh, some patients are not able to do this or some surgeons prefer the uh, general anesthesia, so they have to use uh, the somatosensory or uh, evoke potentials or EEG or TCD. But we prefer the awake surgery, which is very, very easy. And anatomic details. So uh, you should prepare the carotid appropriately. Most important to have a preparation at the distal end of the carotid to be sure that you can see the healthy, healthy lumen. It's the most important point. Then you remove the plaque. Here is the common carotid. Here is the external carotid. And here is the internal carotid. So we remove the plaque. And the most important point is a finish the, the distal end of the plaque and prevent here the dissection of the of the vessel. So this is very important, very important point. 
uh, for the you will see the video so uh, very important it go to sternocranial mastoid muscle then you directly palpate carotid we never uh, identify interleged uchuli vein you will see we go directly to the to the to the carotid then you divide only facial nerve and uh, no facial face sorry facial vein facial vein to open the, the wound here and then if you identify superior trader artery you know that this is external internal carotid without any 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 roots and then it is very important the nerve so never touch vagal nerve and we always should identify the hypoglossal nerve which is very important to know about this we can cut the ansa cervicalis because ansa innervate uh, infrahyoid muscles if you cut this it doesn't any consequences, but very often you can elevate the hypoglossal nerve. It's, it's a very important point if you need if you need a very distal approach for the carotid uh, artery. So vagal nerve never touch. Why? Because the recurrence uh, may 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 create a hoarseness, aphonia, dyspnea. So this is very important complication. So never never touch the vagal nerve. Uh, here is a video, very short video. But we plan the skin incision. We know the level of the bifurcation. So this is subcutaneous tissue. And our first marker is a sternocleid muscle. Uh, if you do go here along the anterior or medial, medial uh, border of the sternocleid muscle, you directly go and palpate the carotid artery. You see, we never identify uh, the jugular vein. It's not necessary. Now we identify the thyroid, superior thyroid artery. Then you exactly know that here is a external carotid, and here laterally is a internal carotid. So you should prepare all the vessel for for the clip. Common carotid. Here is a. We are down. Here is a. We go here distally, so here's a internal carotid. Now we clip the uh, thyroid artery, external clip, and now we test the patients. We clamp the common carotid and we evaluate the patients. If there is good collateralization, the patient can speak and move. So now we know there is no deficit, so we operate without any shunt. And the patient has very good collateralization, so we can open the vessel and we can remove the plaque without any shunting or without any uh, problems because the collateralization is here. So we we uh, do arteriotomy in the common carotid and we go then directly exactly in the midline to the internal carotid and. Uh, we will start to remove the plaque. Very important to find appropriate uh, interface between vessel wall and between the plaque. So first we start uh, identify the proximal part of the plaque. Then we use a micro scissors. We cut the cut the plaque. Here we are downstream, so here is no no big problem. Most important part is on the distally. Now we remove the plaque from the external carotid. And yes, external. And now it's most important point. So we go now to the internal carotid. And we now we cut more the uh, internal carotid because we uh, should be sure that we see the health lumen of the, of the carotid. Now you can see exactly the end of the plaque. And then... You use the micro scissors and you cut the plaque exactly, not create some remnant or some space for dissection of the vessel. So this is most important, very important to use microscope. Vascular surgeons don't use the microscope. I think it's very important point. You should see all the details and you can see plaque is removed, but now under the microscope uh, with the water, saline, with the heparin, you should clean exactly the lumen. Uh, you can see that it's not exact. So we 
we clean all the, all the debris and we should be sure that the lumen is absolutely clean for any or any remnants so if if you are sure that if everything is perfect then we can start the suturing so we we start in the distal part it's most difficult because vessel here is narrow but under microscope you uh, as is you suture the bypass so you see exactly the border of the vessels and you suture in the one layer prolen 60 and we never use a patch because if you have a microscope you can reconstruct the vessel without any stenosis and uh, we finish the one layer pro and six zero suture. Very important how to remove the clips. First, for two seconds, we remove the, by, by uh, retrograde flow from internal cord, we remove the bubbles. And now they, we open the blood first to the external carotid, where all the debris goes now to the muscles of the, of the face. And after a couple of seconds, we open as the last, the internal carotid because brain need absolutely clean blood without any any debris after surgery. So the removing the clips is a very important point. Then we control the bleeding. Uh, if there is some small bleeding, we can use the surgical cell or you can wait a couple of minutes. Usually not necessary to add some more stitches if you suture very regular distance and the, that's it. So usually this procedure is about one hour or one hour, 20 minutes. And um, major complication. So very important is a perioperative stroke. So our surgery, the quality of the surgery is uh, measurable by your perioperative stroke. So very important is gentle exposition of the carotid, not manipulate, not create embolization to the brain. You will see on the diffusion after surgery if you are gentle or not. Then we use a heparin, uh, generally for all patients 5,000. This is very good. Distal end of the plaque, prevent kinking after after removing the plaque. Sometimes the, the vessel is very, very weak, so you should prevent kinking and, and uh, care about the position of the carotid. And very important point, hypotension on ICU. Never hypotension the blood pressure in ICU because of the hypotension creates a thrombosis and all, not all, but majority of the complications created by bad intensive care. So you should be very good, good organization and patient after carotid surgery should be in very, very good care about the blood pressure and everything. Second point, the uh, cranial nerve injury. So hypoglossal nerve, sometimes if you too much manipulate patient could have a temporary hypoglossal passive, but it's not so so devastating. It's a, it's a temporary vagal nerve, never touch vagal nerve because the complication with hoarseness and some breathing problems. So uh, we should avoid this. Minor complications, wood hematoma sometimes happens, especially patient if it's patient on the dual antigregation. We already said that the, for symptomatic patient, we accept dual integration because the main point is to prevent the, the recurrent stroke. So we operate this patient, but sometimes you can see hematoma. It's not the problem. The patient has a drain. And uh, in the majority of the patients, it's necessary some, some uh, repeat surgery, but it's very rare. Anticoagulation, we know 5,000 for 5,000 heparin. And in the ICU, we monitor uh, coagulation time. And the first day heparin, three times day, 5,000, and the second day, the patient goes to the normal ward, standard ward, and they have only aspirin. So we put heparin only first day on the ICU. So that, uh, that's the surgery. After surgery, we do diffusion first day. So now you can see our preparation of the carotid was good, was gentle, no new additional spots of the ischemia. It's very good. Then we recommended the patients ASA for the whole life. And then we, in the, our outpatient clinic, monitor blood pressure, diabetes, L LDL cholesterol, and we control the patient after three months after surgery. And then we control them every year by ultrasound. 
So this is uh, carotid surgery, uh, the care about these indications, and we can discuss more in the end. But I already, I already said that carotid enterectomy is a gate, it's a key for the uh, program of the prevention of the ischemia. Now we can speak more about uh, emergency, emergency indications. So we do in our department very early surgery. So recommendations is do the surgery within the two weeks. But now we do it the same day or the next day. So 48 hours after, after stroke or TIA and show you some, uh, some uh, numbers. So recommendations are very strong, 70 and more percent, even for 50 and more percent. So symptomatic patients indicated for, for uh, active approach. Here you can see nice article about symptomatic stenosis. And you can see that within two weeks is the best, best uh, recommendation for the, it, it, it's a stronger recommendation if you do later, later, later after 12th week, there is the, the 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 advantage of the active approach. It's not so strong. So within the two weeks. And uh, why we do this philosophy to do the surgery within the same day or the next day? Because of the risk of the recurrent stroke is the highest in the first two weeks. So this is the recommendation to do acute surgery. If you do the surgery very early, I think your prevention is more effective. But which are the results? So this is the results from a different department and they had 11% of the, of the complications, uh, stroke and mortality, which is unacceptable. We know that maximum is 6%. So we evaluated our patients and you can see that uh, in our department, we do about, we do more and more uh, symptomatic cases and after discussion with our neurologist, you can see how we decreased the time, the interval between the onset of the of the ischemic problems and the surgery. So now we have about three uh, mean three days from the from the uh, TIA to the to operation, which is very reasonable because we we uh, minimize the risk of the recurrent stroke. But here is Amor Amorosis Fugax, the communication with the ophthalmic doctors, it's not so effective because the speech with neurologists here is more easy. But uh, if the patient says only, only Amorosis Fugax, the, the timing, it's not so acute as we, as we want. And um, our results. So uh, we um, evaluated the patients with this acute approach. So, so indication criteria, you already know, no, not disabling stroke on TIA, approachable stenosis, maximum C2, reasonable internal status. We do the awake surgery, diffusion before and after, microscope, careful dissection. So stroke, transport, diffusion, operation, diffusion in the same day, as you can see, we have a 277 patient in this philosophy, emergency CIA, and this is an older, older set of the patients. Uh, it was in not this acute regimen. And you can see the results are the same. It's the most important stroke and uh, death and uh, um, infarct myocardial. So this is the same. Paresis of the cranial nerves is even better because we are more and more experienced. Every year, 150 cases. So this is better. Hematoma, same. Hyperperfusion better, diffusion lesion a little bit more diffusion lesions uh, on the diffusion on the diffusion after surgery because the acute surgery the the, the plaque it's not so stable but all these cases are asymptomatic so it's only radiological marker not clinical and intraluminal shard only 10 11 percent so it's the same and the uh, last. Uh, Last moment, why we use a selective shunting? Because if you see the diffusion, the patients with the shunt, they have a, in 32% have a new uh, ischemia on the diffusion. If you we use a surgery without the shunt, so it's only 4% new uh, 
uh, ischemic lesion. So you can see it's very significant uh, difference. So we try to use shunt only in the patients with uh, no collateralization, and therefore the AVEX surgery is very good and a reliable method. If you uh, should know more about uh, our strategy for patients who are not able to do AVEX surgery, so we use now cerebral oximetry, and you can study this article that uh, uh, during the duty we have not always uh, accessible for uh, electrophysiological monitoring. So we use the cerebral oximetry for indicating shunt or not shunt. And you can study this article, which is um, relatively new, new uh, philosophy and very, very elegant. But it's uh, too specific for, for this presentation, but this you can study this, this article. Okay, so we are very happy we organized this year the uh, course for carotid surgery, bypass surgery during the World Congress in the Cape Town. And we were, we had a very good uh, relationship and a very good uh, background about about the, the the experience of the of the of the our attendees and our students. They were very happy and they asked us to visit our department because they like the carotid surgery. I think it's very important. Now we go for the third topic, which is very important, and uh, it's my argumentation why the carotid surgery should be neurosurgery. You know that uh, a stroke, acute stroke with a large vessel occlusion after McLean escaped the studies are treated now with combination of intravenous thrombolysis and mechanical thrombolysis. I think it's a revolution of the medicine. So it is fantastic now, neurologists what can do with the neuroradiologist and uh, this removing of the clot from the M1, it's really fantastic. A number of the patients treated with the mechanical thrombolysis, it's, it speaks about the quality of care because the organized this care is not easy. And the best results in Europe, Europe now is Germany and Czech Republic in my country. Why? Uh, you can see that the per million in Czech Republic, in Germany, we are able to do 100 cases of mechanical thrombolysis per year. 100 per year per million. Why? Because we are a small country, 10 million people, 10 region. Each region has a center for mechanical thrombolysis, uh, centers for the intravenous thrombolysis. The system is, is very effective and we are able to care about all patients at the very same level because small country and the organization is not so... It's not so difficult, but still today, we start the program 2010 and now in 2023, we have a twice more, we have 200 patients per year per million. It means that we can say this incidence of, of, the, of the stroke. So all the patients with the stroke of the large vessel, they have a care in, in our country and it's about 200, 220 per million per year. And what is important for us? Because 20% of these patients with mechanical thrombolysis, they, the etiology of the stroke is in the carotid stenosis. So this patients like this in the future, near future, in all countries, they will do 200 patients thrombectomy per million per, per year. They will vis see these patients, about 20, 40 patients every year. So it's a typical case in emergency, occlusion M M1, stenosis of the carotid. So the neurologist, neuroradiologist are able to remove the clot from the M1 by a mechanical thrombolysis. You can see recognition, fantastic results, but here is the residual stenosis. And what to do? We say this case is an ideal case for the carotid surgery. The same day after mechanical thrombolysis because half-life of the of the the RTPA is very short, two hours. So we, we I'll show you our, our, our group of the patients. We do surgery after mechanical thrombolysis. Why? Because stenting is dangerous. The patients, it's acute patients. They have no dual anti-aggregation. They are not prepared for stenting. So solution is to do surgery. And how to do this surgery? So these patients, surgery, 
no complications, diffusion the same. So we can uh, do this, this procedure. But what we learned, it's very important. If we recommend to do the surgery 12 hour, hour mechanical thrombectomy, because we need to know two things. How is the diffusion? If the necrosis is only 30% of the MCA territory is acceptable for the acute surgery. And the second, we should know how is the coagulation status of the patient. If there is some uh, coagulation disbalance, we should wait and, uh, and, and uh, correct it. So uh, normal case, we evaluate diffusion, coagulation, and after 12 hours after the thrombectomy, we do surgery of the carotid. And uh, exceptions for one side, it's two, if the patient is a very unstable, repeated tear, very severe stenosis, we can do this surgery in a very early, uh, very early policy, maybe six hours after the thrombectomy, but we should be sure about the acceptable diffusion, acceptable uh, coagulation. And the third scenario, if the patient has some problems here, coagulation of the too large ischemia or hematoma, we should wait and we don't do this acute surgery. So this is very easy protocol. And we say, yes, after thrombectomy, please let's start to do carotid. Stand, no, because the patient is not prepared. But for indication of the timing, we should know the dynamics of the neurological status. We should know the diffusion, how large is the, the uh, necrosis, and we should know about coagulation. If everything is okay, we do the surgery 12 hours the same day after thrombectomy. If very acute patients, we can do earlier. If the patient with a problem with the coagulation or with a too large diffusion, we wait usually one week control the patient, and then we do the surgery with the delay. So <clears throat> I try to convince you that this is a new topic. We need a team cooperation in cerebrovascular centers between neurologists, neuroradiologists, neurosurgeons. But I think vascular surgeon is not able to discuss about diffusion, about neurological status, about crescendo, decrescendo TIA. So I think it's a new topic, and it definitely it's a new field for young generation for neurosurgeon. So if you start with the carotid, easy carotid, asymptomatic, symptomatic, then you can start with this very unstable patient, but it makes sense. I'll show you why it makes sense. Because neuroradiologists will argue, it's no problem. We can stand the patients acutely after thrombectomy because they have a forced scenario. So each scenario bring the risk. So majority of the neuroradiologists will say, I remove the cloth from the M1, and then I use a 500 milligram aspirin, Reopro or Integralin, it's okay, I, I can stand it. But in the register, you can see they have a 20% of symptomatic intracranial hematoma. So it's a high number. So it's possible, but you risk 20% of the bleeding. And also you risk the 17% of occlusion of the carotid because it's not regular dual anti-aggregation. This is acute regimen, which is risky for hematoma and also for occlusion. Second scenario of the radiologist, they will agree, okay, we can do stand without any anti-thrombotic agents, but it's very bad because the risk of the stent thrombosis is 27%. They can do also balloon angioplasty. Not good idea. Seven day stroke risk is 10% and 31% occlusion rate. And uh, no intervention, it's unacceptable because the carotid stenosis is the etiology of the, of the big stroke. And if you do nothing and you leave the stenosis, you have uh, as high risk as 60% at one day and 40% occlusion rate. So this, this policy is, is unacceptable. And if you see the literature, so uh, this is confirmation of my of my words. There is no agree about pre-procedural and intra-procedural antiplatelet regime. So they have no consensus of how to do these acute patients. The same here, another article and registry, no consensus. Here, uh, Titan uh, database, they don't 
evaluate re-occlusion of the carotid. So it's very important and most important point. So our recommendation for these patients after thrombectomy, we should do carotid surgery and we, we, we know how manage the timing, usually 12 hours after the thrombectomy when we evaluate the diffusion and the coagulation. If any problems, we wait, delayed surgery one week. If we have very acute patients, which is dependent of the high pressure or which is under crescendo TIA every hour, every minute, so we can operate earlier than 12 hours, but we should be sure that we have good acceptable diffusion and good coagulation. So I hope it's, it's acceptable and understandable for you. And I think it's very good topic for neurosurgeons for argumentation for the vascular surgeon, how we we'll overtake this procedure. You can see reality in the near future, all the countries will have the same number, 100 of the 200 per million per year. And this number will create 20, 40 patients like this for every country, for every hospital. How are our results? We have now 105 patients. Comparable is a registry in the Scandinavia. And we have uh, these patients in these years, this uh, range of age. And you can see we have morbid and mortality 6.6. .6. So I think it's very acceptable number, which is acceptable even for a normal symptomatic stenosis. So we are very nicely surprised how good results we have. And all problems where with the hypotension in the ICU after surgery, same day. So my recommendation, if you start with surgery, you should have perfect uh, ICU care and care about blood pressure. So hypotension creates a problem with thrombosis of the carotid. We have uh, experience also with, uh, with the stenting. And uh, if we evaluate the, our stenting in the acute stage, you can see we had a 24% stent occlusion. It's in concordance with my speech uh, before. You can see that this procedure is very risky and 25% occlusion, I think it's unacceptable for, for these patients. And solution is a surgery, which brings only 6% versus uh, stenting, which brings risk. 24% in our hospital. This is our results. Very similar to literature. Conclusion, acute carotid after a thrombectomy uh, bring acceptable risk of the complications, 6%. We reduce significantly recurrent stroke. If you do nothing, there is a 16% of recurrent stroke per day. And uh, carotid surgery is safer than standing because you see 6% versus 24% of the occlusion. And the uh, last uh, word is in the future, you will see in every country 40 patients like this, and these patients should be treated definitely in neurosurgical department with cooperation with the neurologist and neuroradiologist speaking about timing and about management of this, these patients. So we finished the carotid problems, carotid, carotid surgery. Maybe we will discuss in the end of the, of the, of the session. And uh, let's start with the bypass, bypass surgery for hemodynamic ischemia. I, I would like to criticize the, criticize the cost study and the Chinese study and show that uh, these patients, you know, that this, these studies say uh, bypass doesn't bring any benefit for patients because all the, these two studies are, have follow up only two years. I, I think after two years, you cannot conclude. I, I'll show you and say this very, very uh, serious sentence, which is not true. So my answer is that the value for the daily practice is zero <laughs> because the reality is different. So let, let's start with the history. You, you see bypass, bypass, supraterria, supratentoria problems. It's, uh, we have not many evidence because for aneurysm, for tumors bypass, for flow preservation, 
it's a really, very rare cases that we have no randomized studies. The same for the ischemic problems, moya moya disease, hemorrhagic ischemic. Uh, but we have cost study, which is randomized trial, but brings very controversial results, which we, we don't accept. I show you now the, the whole history of the bypass and uh, to understand why it's not acceptable. Uh, very important that the bypass surgery started in 1967 when Yasargir and bypass the same day in America, in Zurich, in Europe, they say, let's start to do the first bypass on the patient. They, they were friends because Yasargir was in uh, Vermont, in Burlington for study stay, and they, Yasargir learned the, this technique from, from uh, his friend. So they they, they started the bypass surgery the same day, 1967. And uh, after this date, the, the whole world started to use the bypass for carotid occlusion, for carotid stenosis, M1 stenosis. So it was wide and also wild indication because there at that time was not clear indication criteria, but still high numbers and let's say, good reputation of the surgery. But then came Barnett study in 1985. It was neurologist. And they say bypass bring no benefits. So bypass in many centers uh, stopped, but many criticism started with this Barnett study. It was not good methodology, but what is important at that time was no method for identifying of the patient with the impaired cerebral hemodynamics. The time was only occlusion of the carotid of, okay, let's let's do bypass. But it was not very precise indication. Uh, what changed next in 10 years later, Schmiedek published very important article about cerebrovascular, cerebrovascular reserve capacity, which means that we now are able to identify patients with occlusion of the carotid, but with very insufficient collateral flow. You can see evaluation with the SPECT on the baseline at the normal status. And this patient has a normal flow, but all this hemisphere is in the dilatation, the vessels are dilatated. And if you challenge the patient with the acetazone or CO2, it means vasodilatation uh, impulse. So the vasodilatation here is it's, it's at maximum and after vasodilatation uh, medication, they are not able to increase the dilatation. So this is method for identification of the patient with a very bad collateralization and with a, with a very low uh, cerebrovascular capacity. So this is a very important point, how to exact uh, indicate the patient for the surgery. So which patients are indicated? It's still today. A recurrent episode of cerebral ischemia. So it's not patient with a territorial infarct. No, it's, it's a recurrent episode of cerebral ischemia, which are recurrent. And, uh, and DCA or CTA, you see carotid occlusion. On CT, it's normal CT on only border zone infarction, not territorial infarct, but border zone between MCA and the uh, and, uh, anterior uh, cerebral artery, so 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 called border zone infarction or watershed infarction. That is acceptable, and most important, the patient should be evaluated for cerebral vascular reserve capacity by SPECT by perfusion CT and normal after vasodilatation impulse or bold or perfusion MRI or with quantitative MRI, I show you the picture. So very important to evaluate, to have in the department this tool and evaluate the reserve capacity and then say, okay, this patient is indicated or not. And we know from the, all the literature that the patient, if you evaluate the patients with the TCD, the, the annual, if the, the Reserve capacity is diminished, it's, 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 it's bad. So we have about 8% of annual risk of the stroke. If you use the PET methodology, which is more precise and you select more risky, more ill patients, there is a risk about 10% stroke risk per year. 
it's it's very high per year and so this is a history of the bypass yasargo started wild use barnet drop then schmiedek cerebrovascular capacity and a PET uh, methodology and all the world in this uh, period was waiting for the result of the cost study, which used this PET methodology for evaluation of the, of the patients. And we all expected that cost will be positive and all the world will start with the suturing bypass more and more. But what happens? We know that the risk of the stroke, if the patient has occluded carotid, is about 10%. But in the cost study, which was organized in the US, they projected 40% in two years, which is a mistake because we know per year 10, it should be 20% over here, the plan. And the reality, yes, it was 22% because we know all, all the time and many years ago. And the surgical group has a better results, but not significantly better. So they stop the study and say, we expected 40%, but it's only 20%. So we stopped the study because here is a discrepancy between our expectation and reality. So, yes, it's in spite of the excellent bypass potency, but they stopped the surgery because the uh, uh, medical group has much more better uh, results than expected. And why? Why the results in, in, in the medical group is much more better than expected. Because in the St. Louis course, it was preliminary study. They used very, very precise PET methodology and they had only 18 patients which had 50% in two year stroke rate. So it was very good methodology, very risky patients, but and, and based on this results of the 18 patients, they created all the budget at the older all the design of the study course, but reality was that the selection of the patient in the course study was not so precise and the patient was much more risky. And therefore, the study was uh, was uh, finished because, stopped, because this methodology was not the same. Uh, logically, the medical group was much more better results than planned. So, and it, it, it brings uh, big problems. Study design was only two years, but in the carotid studies, in all the studies, we need five, 10 years. Two years, nothing, because the patients are young. We, we should know the, the follow-up minimum five years. But this is a big, big problem. Sample size, very small, and budget, very small. So there were no money to follow the patient five years, because you will see, if we follow in the course study, five years, it would be very positive for surgery. Why? Because inside in the study, we see that we, after bypass, we reduce the risk, the risk of the stroke from 11% per year to 3% per year. This is absolutely important information inside the cost study. But in the conclusion, you never, you never see it. You should study very, very precisely and you discover this important point. So if you see after 10 years, here will be a very high number, a very low number in the, in the risk of the stroke. So this is problem. Study was stopped after two years, but the potential inside the study, if we have money for control the patient, would be very, very significantly, significantly beneficial for the surgical patients. And you can see here, so, this is a cost study. After surgery, we reduce the surgical, uh, we, we, we reduce the risk to 3%. The same, the JET study in Japan, they reduced the, the risk of the medical group 14 to 5%. It was very good methodology and they were more risky patients. But it's it's uh, the, the same problem. So this is uh, uh, our repeating. So. Uh, the study was, was uh, halted because of utility analysis, but risk difference from 11 to 3%, which is 8% difference, but not addressed by the, by the, by the study because uh, for the better evaluation was not 
not cost, not, not budget. And uh, the time would need it more patients for evaluation of a longer follow-up. So this is very important, but inside the study, we have very good numbers about the benefit of the surgery. Very important graph for this. And the second problem is a very high perioperative morbidity mortality with a surgical group because the selection of the of the of the departments was very bad. Only two days course, what was 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 uh, acceptable or to do only ten bypasses with good results. I think. Uh, you you know that if you do bypass, you need more experience, and therefore, fifteen percent of the stroke perioperative is unacceptable. And uh, we see in my department, in all departments which do bypass, still we have about half of of this uh, of this complication. So, from the uh, medical side, it's a very big mistake in the methodology. And from the surgical side, it's also unacceptable, very high. Morbidity mortality, 15%, which, which is not, not normal. And therefore, we organized study in my department because we were upset about the results of the cost study. So we evaluated our patients. We had the same primary uh, endpoint. We have the same number of numbers. It was coincidence. We have the very similar protocol, but we didn't use the PET methodology. We used the TCD screening then SPECT or perfusion CT. And uh, in the last year now, we use a quantitative MRI. So uh, very shortly, you can see very elegantly how to screen the patients. Para patient has a recurrent ischemic stroke. He has occlusion of the carotid. If you evaluate the TCD, you can see very elegantly that this site is an occluded carotid. So you can see normal ventilation, MCA, eight centimeters per, per, per minute. So it's uh, uh, velocity in the normal state. After CO2 inhalation, which is a vasodilatation impulse, the same. So you can see there is a uh, reactivity is uh, zero. No, no uh, res reserve capacity for dilatation. And after hyperventilation, there should be some uh, was, was, was a constriction also the same. So this is typical patient with uh, exhausted cerebral vascular reserve capacity by TCD. On the other side, left side, normal ventilation, velocity 30. After CO2, vasodilatation impulse 46. It's plus 50%, which is normal reactivity. After hyperventilation, you can see vasoconstriction, it's, it's a certain normal 16. So this side is normal, normal reactivity. This side needs helps. How we help? Bypass. Bypass augmentation of the flow. Second method you can use, and we use also perfusion CT, steady state after, after uh, diamox, you, you see also the, 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 the difference and, and you can indicate patient with the semi-quantitative method of the perfusion CT. And now we use a quantitative, uh, NOVA quantitative MRI, which is relatively new method. Uh, we perform MRI for these patients. You can see uh, MRI, uh, normal, normal uh, fashion. And then we use oblique sign phase contrast and in this software and methodology, you can measure the flow in the carotid, in the A1, M1, and you evaluate the patient directly with milliliter per minute flow, and you do steady state, and then after injection of the acid azole amide, which is vasodilatation impulse. And the normal, way of, of, of the evaluation, the normal patient should have after vasodilatation impulse should have a plus 10%. This patient has had only 9% evaluation of the flow. So this patient has a diminished or decreased uh, cerebrovascular reactivity. And this is indication for augmentation with bypass. So bypass, and you can see nice augmentation with the STA. And if you see here, now after bypass, you can see increasing after vasodilatation 36%. It's much more improved. So this is normal reactivity after bypass. And you can see the bypass brings about 40 milliliter cc per minute. So this is nice bypass, 
very nice flow for the millimeters per minute. So this is this is a, a evaluation protocol. Now, before I, I show you our results, we can go uh, how how we do the bypass. I think it's also very educative. Now we speak about uh, indications. So this patient had a recurrent ischemic stroke, paresthesias, and uh, weak uh, hemiparesis. CT is normal or borders or infarction. We evaluate them for TCD, no reactivity, perfusion CT, and today we do also quantitative uh, uh, MRI NOVA. And for the surgery, very important is this consideration. So anesthetic consideration, so perfect stability of the blood, blood pressure, you know it already, very important. Uh, before, during, and after surgery, Permanent normocapnea, no, no, no uh, hyperventilation because it creates uh, vessel constriction. Antibiotics prophylaxis as usually, and no clopidogrel. In the bypass, we accept only ASA before surgery. Patient position, Mayfield, operation, uh, operative floor or horizontal to the floor. Then uh, it's important to know from evaluation that the STA is a uh, in good shape, and uh, we palpate the STA, we mark the, the planned uh, skin incision. Usually, we use a parietal branch for the bypass, especially if the frontal branch is involved in the collateralization in the ophthalmic artery, so we prefer the uh, parietal branch. And uh, the center of the uh, craniotomy is about six, five centimeters above the tragus to be above distal part of the sylvian fissure. And uh, then we do the craniotomy. Here's a sylvian vein, and we prefer to use a temporal, temporal, uh, temporal uh, arteries on, on the cortical, cortical arteries as an acceptor. But depends of the of the shape of the artery, and he is a donor STA, and very important how to prepare the the donor. So we we cut the, the vessel in the forty five angle, and then we add the fish mouthing. You can see the fish mouthing brings much more uh, area of the, of the of the communication after suturing, and I should stress that we have a laboratory, and before the surgery we always go for training. I might personally have experience go 100 bypasses, but still, if I do bypass, I go to laboratory day before, ideally three days before to be absolutely in shape and to be able to do bypass in 25 minutes maximum. We have limited 30 minutes, our aim. And uh, here is uh, the camping of the cortical vessel, then you make the uh, arteriotomy, then we wash, precisely wash the, all the blood for the cortical artery, then we suture, bypass, and to side, usually 12, 12 stitches. You know it from laboratory very well. And after surgery, we have no uh, post-operative headrest because uh, to prevent uh, any, any comp comp compressing the, the bypass. Very important, the uh, strict blood pressure control. And uh, we do CT NGO, endopler, and oral aspirin. That's it. And we control the patients every every year by, by, uh, by ultrasound, but TCD. So this is short, short, uh, short video. We have a plan. We do always the linear skin incision. We uh, prepare the STA gently. Then we uh, clip proximally the STA. We wash it with the saline with the heparin. And now the, the donor is prepared. Then we the, the, the donor is here in, in the in the in the safe. And uh, then we do the Small craniotomy, very important to, to have a, a hole here because here goes the STA inside the it's inside the craniotomy. Preparation of the of the donor, fish mouthing, 
Yes, everything is prepared. The first stitch is prepared on the most difficult part of the anastomosis to reduce the time of occlusion. Now we occlude the perforators, we occlude the proximal distal on the artery, and we suture end to side, usually the first stitches. We do interrupted sutures, but depends on your laboratory training, what you prefer. But the time occlusion should be maximum 30 minutes. And after suturing, we control immediately by TCD, nice flow, integrate and nice flow in the brain. And uh, now the, the flow in the brain is augmented. So this is our, our article and we, we have a results. We have mean time 30 minutes. You can see in the cost study, which now we are criticizing the cost study, they, they had time occlusion 45 minutes for patients who didn't uh, develop stroke, but the, the patient of 15% with developed stroke, they have 55 minutes, it's one hour occlusion. It's not acceptable for the study. And therefore we don't accept this study in these results. And our results are this. So we have half then cost 7.5% of the complications. And if we put our results to the, the cost study, you, you, you see that 22% medical group, 9% uh, surgical. So cost would be positive and the recommendation would be, yes, bypass is indicated for hemodynamic ischemia. The all departments which do the surgery, they have the same uh, risk as our department. I show you. Jet study, our study, all 10%, never 21%. You can see a Zurich study, 10%, Singapore, 8%. So all departments, very similar risk, only two years surgical is only 10%. So I think we confirmed that cost study, it's not acceptable for our daily practice. So in conclusion, uh, morbidity mortality, 15%, uh, it's not normal. And uh, th this is uh, parallel, uh, personal communication from the leader of the, of the cost study. Perioperative stroke rate, 8%, instead of 15%, the cost would have been positive in favor of surgery. It's a very important point. So uh, if we conclude the cost trial, it was very bad, bad, uh, very bad uh, uh, methodology if the selective to the patients and also very bad surgical results. So therefore, you know this article from Sepideh Hanjani, which was conclusion was that we still have reason to believe the selection of the population may benefit from the, from the bypass because we reduce the risk of the stroke from 11% to 3%. But we should have morbidity mortality of the bypass surgery maximum 8%. And if you have 8% morbid mortality, you should uh, continue in this surgery. And also a uh, very important uh, conclusion of the cerebral vascular sections, AA and CNS or AANS. So uh, as well as the fa father study, it's important. And also not only bypass, it's not only important for the the prevention of the hemodynamic ischemia, but also for cognitive results. We have many articles about cognitive improvement and also functional benefits. In, in the Berlin group from Peter Weikolzi, they, they have beautiful articles that after bypass, many, many neurological uh, functions and measurable functions in the neurology improve after the bypass. So it's, they call so hibernated brain. Uh, after bypass, the hibernated brain, it's again awake so this is this is our criticism of the cause and uh, in my country we continue with bypass we do about 40 bypasses per year in country and how the the, the improve the care of the patients the better selection of the patients so now we we do the tcd and now we do a quantitative mri sometimes the combination of perfusion ct and very important also to improve bypass techniques. So in our country, you can visit our regular workshop if in Budweis on the Reds. And we organize every year, every second year in Prague, a workshop on the silastic tubes, which is very practical. 
and for your use and for your shape, it's very important to have easy lap and these vessels and you can train every day. If you train every day, half hour, you will be expert, I'm sure. So this is uh, the criticism of the course. And then we very shortly also should criticize the, the Chinese study. It's just same problem, same mistake. They have 13 centers. They have uh, two groups, surgical uh, and uh, medical group. But they have follow-up only two years. We don't need follow-up two years. We need more follow-up for five years and more. You can see after bypass, it's better results. 8% of the problems. After in medical group, 12%. So it's better results, but again, it's not significant. But inside the study, the same, same uh, as the cost. You can see that this is perioperative morbidity mortality. It's 6%. It's okay. It's better than cost. It's 15 So it, this is reality. But in the, in the long-term stroke risk in the two years, without the, the, the 30 days morbidity mortality, in the surgical group, it's uh, 1% per year. And uh, uh, in the group of the... Uh, medical treatment is a five years. Again, in selected patients, we reduce the stroke risk from 5% to 1%. Stroke reduction, 4% per year. It's very similar to cost, but the selection of the patients here in China was more weak. So this patient it was not so risky, but still the bypass bring 4% reduction per year, which is significant number. But if you have follow up only two years, we have better results after after bypass, but it's not significant. But after after five years, it will be very, very significant. You can see how differs the, the, the number. So if we see the table cost, our study, Chinese study, you can see same results, the surgical surgery, it's about 10, 9% of the surgical risk. So their results are okay, but for the reliable conclusion, we need follow up five years, not two years. So conclusion of this study that uh, these findings do not support the uh, addition of bypass surgery to make a therapy for treatment of the patient with symptomatic exclusion. Of it's it's not true because it's only two years follow up. And we need follow-up of the five and more years. If you see on the carotid studies, uh, we never see in the carotid studies follow-up two years. All have a five years and more. And uh, this is very important. And if the, the Chinese study would have a five years follow-up, they would be absolutely positive for surgery because we reduce the stroke rate 4% every year. Second point, the... Next study, we should uh, have a, another study with the PET PET uh, PET uh, selection of the patient because it's very precise and it, it's selection of very risky patients. But you will see the point three in all study the the unstable patients and very acute patients are not enrolled in the studies because it brings problem with with the organization if the patient is unstable to have some stroke before surgery. So. This is also a very important problem of all studies, COS and SMEMOS, because these hot, unstable patients are not involved in the, in the studies. And therefore, my, my answer is this study doesn't answer us about reality, because now we see that we do this hot table, hot, unstable patients about 15 per year. So we care about 1 million patients as in normal neurosurgery. So every area in the world, they will see about 15, 15 hot, unstable patients which need acute bypass. But this is not involved in these studies. And therefore, conclusion of these studies with only two years of follow up harms the neurological practice and harms the patients because reality is different. For not hot patients, you we can see big difference after 10 years, big difference. And we need these studies. And this is reality. And also hot patients are not involved in this in this study. So my conclusion and conclusion of all the people who are involved in the bypass surgery, 
they they agree with me and they say yes that's true and uh, this patient does exist but this studies doesn't describe reality and therefore we organize the fellowship for bypass for hemodynamic ischemia so we do in the good wise and in my department so if you are interested in bypass surgery you can send email to to my colleague in the good wise or to me and we have a fellowship for two months, one month in my department. You will finish the training on the celastic tube. If you are uh, okay, if you uh, put the exam, you can go to the step two to suture the, uh, suture the bypass on the animals. And then you have certificate of the fellow of the WFNS that you are educated in the fellowship for bypass surgery. Okay, and let's go for the last, last. It's rare, but I think it's also very important. Vertebral basilar ischemia and uh, revascularization. Very important article that posterior circulation stroke is about 30% of all ischemic stroke. And uh, this territory is very eloquent, so I think it's very important. And the new things is a very tough study, which bring us information how to select patients, which patients need revascularization or stand, and which patient need only only uh, medical treatment. This study was very very elegant, and they evaluate the patient with a symptomatic intracranial or extracranial stenosis in the vertebral artery, extracranial or intracranial. So the study vertebral arteries, basilar arteries, stenosis more than 50%, symptomatic patients, and they evaluate this patient with, again, quantitative MRI. So quantitative MRI is MRI. You put the uh, point of the interest, and the point of the interest here is a flow in the both vertebral arteries, in the basilar artery, and the posterior arteries. And you can select the patients very elegantly to the two groups. Normal flow is patient which basilar flow more than 120 cc. If it has normal flow in basilar, it's normal patients. If not, if not, you should study the PCA flow. If the flow is less than 40 cc in PCA, this is a low flow patient. So we can define the low flow and normal flow patients. And the low flow patients, they have annual risk 22%. Very risky patients. You remember in a COS study or bypass study, usually if we select the patients at the TCD, they have uh, around 8% with PET 10% per year. So this posterior fossa, very risky patient after selection with the quantitative FNOVA, low flow patients, 22% annual risk of the stroke. So for this patient, definitely we need treatment. Endovascular or surgical, depends or hospital or your anatomy and so on. And um, this is our endeavor. We evaluated, uh, we had a grant for the, the, this uh, topic and we evaluated um, these patients and the 14 patients needed intervention. Two patients needed intervention with stent and angioplasty and one patient was appropriate for surgery. I show you the, this patient for surgery. Very nice case. This young male had a vertebral basal stroke, vertigo, and also peripheral palsy, uh, uh, seventh nerve. And uh, you can see the patient had the occlusion of the both, both vertebral arteries. No collateralization. And if we have DSA, you see the vertebral basal system is filled only retrogradely through the PCOM. This is a record retrograde fraud, which goes to the V3 segment here on the left side. Very important for our thinking. So vertebral basal system, it's low flow, are filled only retro by retrograde. This is DSA from lateral view. You can see PCOM, retrograde basilar, and very very low flow in the posterior fossa. So this is very risky patient, and he needs definitely revascularization. You can see what is here, occipital artery. So our idea, I, later, so first indication, so very important was evaluation by quantitative MRI. You can see retrograde flow PCOM, very low flow in basal artery, 
very low flow everywhere. So this is typical low flow patients. And our idea was augment the flow with the occipital artery to this horizontal segment V3 of the vertebral artery because the retrograde flow goes here, directly here. So it's easy situation. We don't need craniotomy. We just need preparate uh, the occipital and to make end to side bypass to augment the flow to the vertebral basilar system. This is a uh, methodology how to harvest occipital artery, the gastric roof, and uh, uh, laterally is occipital roof. So this is technique from proximal to distal preparation. You can go also from distal to proximal, we, but we use from, from here to here. And uh, this is the surgery. So this is a patient in the prone position. This is a skin incision preparation from the proximal to distal. Uh, preparation of the occipital artery, then transposed to the to the horizontal V3 segment. No craniotomy. We just the drill to the uh, to the arch of the C1, not to be so deep. Now you see beautifully the retrograde flow to the vertebral artery. Now we use the occipital artery irrigation saline with heparin, and now. The occipital artery is transposed to the acceptor, which is vertebral artery. We use a 45 degree of the cut and the fish mouthing. And this is the vertebral artery, V3 segment. Again, we, we use the interrupted suture. In this suture, we use the uh, z 90, not 10 0, 9 0, because the vertebral artery is very, very large, very thick. So we used this, this uh, uh, system of the anchorage suture one and second, one side, second side. We pay attention always of the laboratory training and always you can see both the walls to put the, the stitches exactly. And this is the proximal wall interruption suture again about 30 minutes time occlusion but here it's not so important because we have retrograde flow and we we have no stress here because the flow it's very low in the vertebral basal system is retrograde but still we should be, be able to do the, the bypass within the 30 minutes now we open the uh, vertebral open the occipital. Now you can see nice congruence because the occipital artery is very elastic, nice flow. And we use the uh, ICG flow from the external carotid, occipital artery, vertebral artery, and go to the vertebral vertebral system. Beautiful pictures after surgery. Carotid, internal carotid, this is external. This is occipital, bypass, and flow. Bypass and flow. Uh, if we evaluate the quantitative MRI before or after, this is after, nice flow through the bypass, and we have normal flow. Normal is a 40 cc and more. We have more than 40 in, in. so we, we uh, before the low flow patients, 22% annual risk of the recurrent stroke. After bypass, normal flow, normal flow in the PCA. So very elegant bypass and uh, improvement of the chance of the patient. So conclusion, for the vertebral basilar symptomatic patients, we should use the quantitative MRI. It's only software for your normal uh, MR, MR equipment. If the patient has a stenosis more than 50% in a vertebral or basilar artery, we should evaluate the patient by quantitative MRI. If there is a low flow patient, very high risk per year, we should indicate for stent or angioplasty or for surgery. Which are surgeries for this vertebral basilar area? We can use a vertebral carotid transposition. In the case, if the stent is not possible, we can do transposition of the stenotic orificium of the vertebral artery to carotid and to do, and to do transposition. Or in our case, we can augment the vertebral basilar system by uh, bypass. So this is 
This is a, a occipital artery to V3. It's our case. Or you can do the, the trunk of the occipital artery to the V3 vertical. Or you can do occipital artery to pica if the retrograde flow is not so it's not so good. And even you can use the interposophenous vein graft from the carotid to the vertebral artery, which is also very good for some endovascular procedure intracranially. So in, in cooperation, you can use this bypass. So th this is our uh, relatively new new uh, area in the vertebral basilar ischemia, but you need quantitative MRI to be able to select the low flow patients which need uh, your your revascularization process. So I think we can finish and this is a relatively new program if the surgery for stroke prevention carotid is a key bypass and also vertebral basal ischemia. Thank you. I hope the time is okay. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. We owe you a huge thanks for this amazing lecture. And sir, it means so much. I don't have the words to explain how grateful we all are and how much we are deeply impressed for the immense knowledge you have shared with us. Because, sir, frankly, many of us who are especially the young neurosurgeons, we do have a lot of difficulties in traveling to other parts of the world because uh, obviously there are visa issues, there are delays, there are uh, um, if issues of leave, especially when you are a junior neurosurgeon or you are a trainee, you cannot find leave and go to another country. So uh, by attending these virtual conferences and your wonderful webinars, we we are having a huge pre privilege that we are able to learn from masters like you and we are keep on improving ourselves to the, our best possible and um, it is you are making it possible for all of us to learn so in this room um, we are having people from all over the world people are attending from central america from latin part of the of america from north america from europe from asia from africa and you, you can see i was so intrigued that everyone was so much glued and we were all so much uh, in, uh, deeply grateful to you for this amazing lecture and for this huge opportunity i don't think i have words to tell you how much deeply we are grateful to you for your time and for this amazing lecture and everyone is sending you wonderful wishes um again from all over the world we can see uh people from my own country, Pakistan, from Latin America, from Nicaragua, from Honduras, from Uganda, from Afghanistan, from Iraq, and um, from, um, uh, there is another person, I think, from Russia, and they are just uh, sending you a lot of wishes. Sir, again, thank you very, very, very much. Um, thank you for the invitation. Thank you. <laughs> Then again, this is a very new topic, and I think that many of the it was quite new for many, many of the of the neurosurgeons. So yeah. uh, there are there are a number of questions over here, uh, especially so regarding the CAS and the CEA indication, because you know uh, you have very nicely explained about the CEA and for carotid stenting CAS. So um, must um, but there is you know something that many of the of uh, the it is quite new for everyone. So uh, they really wish to have this uh, a little bit more that um, uh, like CEA is the standard, it's the best treatment and much superior to CAS and CAS would be in, in only the high risk elderly age group and obviously those legions which are at high above. So, so just um, I would just request you to just give a little bit, uh, uh, a little uh, explanation for those who are a little new to this uh, indication of CEA versus carotid stunting. They, um, uh, they, they are a little bit of confused in this. <laughs> Uh, for uh, carotid stenting? Yes, sir. They really wish to know that when to do a carotid stenting. Aha. So, uh, for carotid stenting, we have nice studies about uh, surgery and the stenting. Generally, the results are very similar, but for stenting, we usually we discuss every patient very, very uh, individually. So, our neuroradiologists, they help us with the stenosis, which is very high, which is not ac uh, uh, accessible for surgery. Uh, also for restenosis, if there is restenosis. Also, if the patient is very old, uh, if it's not able to, to do the surgery. So I think still the stent is a uh, mini-invasive. Mini so... 
This is main indications and very important is that to prepare the patients with uh, dual anti, anti aggregation. And after one week of dual anti aggregation, we invite the patients and test them for the resistance on the clopidogrel. And if there is a, everything okay, we can do stand. If there is a resistance, we should uh, use uh, another antiplated regimen. But you can see here medical risk, old patients refusing surgery, very high bifurcation or something scaring or restenosis. So I think this is a main indication for the stand, but very important if you uh, if you indicate the stand to know exactly if the double anti-aggregation, anti, anti, anti platelet is uh, effect effective or not. Yes. Great. Is there, is there also in the intracranial sclerosis, sir, I think um, uh, we are talking about the, the uh, cervical uh, carotid, but sir, in the intracranial atherosclerosis, sir, I think there's also... Um, uh, Intra, intracranial stenosis is a still big problem because the, the former study, Sampris, they had also worse results than medication. So today, the radiologists are very afraid to do stenting intracranially. More now it's recommended to do submaximal angioplasty. So they do some balloon uh, dilatation, but not maximal, submaximal. It, it brings some result, but still we need uh, new studies. And uh, intracranial stenosis is a big problem. So usually we are conservative, but still if the patient is symptomatic in the dual anti-aggregation, so then uh, we can indicate some intracranial procedure, usually the submaximal angioplast. Uh, thank you very much, sir. So there's also uh, another thing that uh, that in my in my mind. So the carotid stenosis uh, with the CPD, the cerebral protective devices. So what do you think about the uh, about uh, CAS with CPDs with carotid with the cerebral protective devices, the filter that is being placed? So do you think that there is something that could do better if we are going for a for a stenting for the cervical carotid stenting? Uh. Uh, again, uh, the the question was about uh, PCD. Uh, sir, for uh, for carotid stenting with cerebral protection devices. Ah, yeah, yeah. Um, sure, I think uh, all these uh, devices are for to, to minimize the the periprocedural uh, stroke, uh, as we also try to be gentle and not to produce new embolization during the procedure, the same the, the, uh, the endovascular treatment, because they they uh, had to go uh, through the stenosis and then put the stent. And this this distal protection, of course, it's 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 a good good uh, good thing. But I think depends on the on the philosophy of each endovascular uh, department. And I am not expert because in my country we are not hybrid. So we do only surgery. And uh, my colleague in the uh, neurological department, they do this endovascular procedure. So, so we interested each other about his work, but the, the, these details, I am not able to answer. Thank you very much, sir. I think this is uh, something uh, of uh, of greater interest, and there's much going on in, in in the literature. I can see there is a new study every year regarding all these things, sir. There's also, um, sir. The, um, apart from this, uh, we have the pseudo aneurysm, which we usually deal with or with the maximal therapy, the medical therapy, and only would consider any intervention if there is intervallic growth or any recurrent ischemia. But sir, there is another study that I came across with this said that in pediatric cases, some of them with the bow hunter, a pediatric bow hunter, a very rather a very rare occurrence. They said that mm -hmm. it might lead to, yes, a recurrent um, um, injury to the vessels. And in that in that case, uh, in pediatric cases, we might be we might be considering surgery. So what do you believe about this? This is a very rare scenario, but for just uh, for interest, for the sake of interest. So what what do you believe about this scenario? Uh, it's it's very rare. So we in my in my experience we don't have this these patients, but we know from literature that that it, it's it's a recurrent. But some surgery it's possible here to the 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 deliberate the, the the artery. But we have no experience because it's very very rare. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, uh, there are also a couple of 
of uh, uh, questions, sir. Somebody is also asking uh, about uh, your recommendation regarding monitoring during uh, during carotid endoarthrectomy. But do you do uh, monitoring during? Uh, I guess there is a question over there. Yes. Um, so I explained that we prefer the, the awake surgery with deep cervical block. So our monitoring is uh, directly the conscious and, and the movement. So we communicate with the patients and for shunt selection, it's very, very uh, effective and very precise because you see if the patient is okay or not. So I think the awake surgery is elegant, but of course, if, if, uh, if you prefer to do the, the general anesthesia, I think it's very, very evoke potentials. It's very, very good method. But I, I recommend you my, our article because it's it's two, two details. We use now the uh, NIRS, NIRS infrared monitoring for both uh, frontal area, which is very easy method. And uh, for carotid surgery during the duty, it's very, it's very elegant. It's very easy. So we measure the nerves on the both hemisphere, and after clamping the external carotid, it's usually some decrease of the of the of the flow, and then we clamp the carotid. And if there is drop ten percent and more, so we put the shunt. So it's it's also, but you you can study in my presentation the, the article. It's very fresh and uh, very elegant, and uh, it's it's a new method. But uh, the advantage is that you don't need electrophysiological uh, monitoring during the night, for instance. So it's easy. It's just you put the, the nurse and you yourself, you can see the numbers. If the 10% drop, you use some. So I think it's very elegant. But of course, the somatosensory evoke potentials are precise and it's well-established methods for, for this. Thank you so much again, sir. Thank you so much. So there's another question. What is the safe clip time when doing carotid eye under uh, Clip, uh, uh, sorry, uh, clip. Safe, safe clip time. Uh, clip type, type. Time. Ah, clip time, Duration. yes. Uh, clip time is usually 30 minutes. 30 minutes and uh, the whole procedure is usually one hour, 20 minutes. So preparation takes uh, gentle preparation. Gentle preparation needs about 20 minutes, then 30 minutes uh, closure of the of the carotids and uh, removing the plaque and the suture. And then let's say uh, 15 minutes meticulous uh, hemostasis and, and closure of the one. So in my department, uh, we we do a lot of this surgery and uh, yes about 10 10 doctors are able to do this surgery because they like it and then uh, we have a lot of cases so i think the even young neurosurgeons are very skillful in this kind of surgery thank you very very much sir sir uh, you have elaborated everything so well and everyone is so much interested in watching the web webinar again the recording and um, also sir again thank you very very much for spending your time there uh, i think uh, and sir there is also some uh, question regarding your uh, preferred anticoagulant sir i think he probably wished to know about the doax the uh, the newly introduced oral anticoagulant i think the uh, the attendee wanted to know about DOEX. I, I cannot find the question now. <laughs> so we are worried inside. Sir, uh, he actually wanted to, I think, ask about the DOEX. Yeah, uh, anticoagulation during the carotid, you mean? Uh, we use uh, 5,000, you can see here. Yeah. And uh, in the old time, we uh, calculate per kilogram, but some anesthesiologists make some, some failure and... Uh, if you do too much and then you do too much protamine, it's some procoagulant, a hypercoagulation, so it's dangerous. So I think the best way, 5,000 and uh, that's it. And uh, if the surgery, it's not too much prolonged for the one and a half hour, 5,000 is exact the time because we measure before, we, we measure the uh, coagulation time, uh, ICP, we measure before, then after 5,000 and then after one hour, uh, you, you nicely see the nice curve zero then goes to the 180 and then goes to 90. So I think the 5000s, it's perfect for cover all the procedure 
if you do this within the two hours. It's 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 sufficient. It's easy. No no space for mistake. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much sir sir thank you it, this this sir, real, this really matters to us sir thank you so much for this amazing and elaborate lecture and uh, sir i think we already wish to invite you again for for a session with us on news thank you thank you so much for the invitation nice nice time thank you thank bye you. bye bye thank you so much sir thank you for coming thank you thanks a lot good luck, sir. Good luck bye in bye, your, sir. your patience thank you sir thank you very much sir Thank, uh, you. thank you everyone thank you so much sir thank you everyone for joining today i have shared the link to the quiz please uh, uh submit the quiz it is an ungraded uh quiz just for your own uh practice so i won't be having this uh, any grading threshold for you to attain obtain your certificate kindly submit the quiz and uh um uh, and, and after submission of your quiz your uh certificate will be directly me to email to you it's a personalized certificate uh with the with you know uh with the stamp of the news so again thank you everyone for joining from every part of the world it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of great honor and pleasure for me and thank you very very much uh for your wonderful remarks and uh I hope I have read all of your messages um if you wish to uh if you wish to say something, uh, please feel free to turn on your videos. And uh, if you have some any message or anything to share, any comment or anything or suggestion, please feel free. And I have already shared the link to the quiz. Please feel free to uh, uh, kindly click the link and to submit the quiz to obtain your certificate. Uh, thank you, Dr. Iftikhar. Thank you very much. And Dr. Ahmed Babad Birda, thank you very, very much. And... Um, and uh, Professor Professor Marvin, thank you very, very much for your wonderful words. And I'm a huge fan of the Nicaragua Grand Round as well. You do a lot of wonderful things uh, on, um, you know, with, uh, with, with neurosurgical education as well. So I'm a huge fan. We are all in this together. And I think uh, being, a, being, being a neurosurgeon myself, it's very important for me to feel what others really need at this stage. And it's a huge privilege that we are able to, and it's all thanks to all these wonderful, uh, wonderful teachers who spend time uh, from their very busy schedules. So uh, thank you, Dr. May Innocente. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Renato Kishi, um, Dr. Maximino Telwis, Dr. Jinendra Ekinayaki. Yeah, wonderful. It was an extremely important topic, I guess, uh, that we all need to know about it. Dr. Marvin, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Omar Adnan. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Marvin, again. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. I think we all owe a lot to all these masters of neurosurgery for all they have done, for all they had their time, and for this, for providing us this huge opportunity to learn directly from them wherever we are in the world. And um, obviously, we all have some issues in traveling. I can feel it because because of visa issue, because of leave issue, because of clearances, there are so much, uh, so many things to look at when we have to travel. So it's like a dream come true to have this privilege. Thank, thank you, Dr. Wasim. Thank you very much, everyone. So I hope you all have received your links to quiz kindly submitted now. And um, thank you, Dr. Posto. And again, please feel free to join my WhatsApp group and my Facebook uh, page and my YouTube channel. We'll have all the recordings. Uh, I also I always keep the recordings of the webinars for everyone to go over again because obviously we all need to look at. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sarah Hither. So please, this is, these are the links. The, the first link is to the WhatsApp group. I usually share all the information in my WhatsApp group, and I will also share all the relevant papers which have been mentioned in the in the lecture in my group. Okay, so uh, you have to just uh, give a look and open the page, open 
those articles okay so you will be able to have to learn more about it it's a very new topic i can see that and also subscribe to my youtube channel you will be able to find all the recordings of my previous lectures including professor Spessler lecture professor michael lawton's lecture the recent lecture with professor alvaro cordoba and uh, lecture with the professor henry schrader all those lectures are available on my youtube channel already so you can just go and see it and all the work and also please feel uh free to you know stay tuned for my book release with professor luis borba this book will be released in um, this month later this month or early in march uh, so inshallah so please uh uh, stay tuned to the release of our book. It's a very handy book for basic neurosurgical procedures, which is targeted for early career neurosurgeons. So you just can carry it everywhere, wherever you like. And we also have provided innovative um, or resources for you to learn. And uh, this is my also my news uh, Facebook page. You can just hit the, the like button, subscribe to the YouTube channel. And also, please, um, I hope... Everyone has received the the link to the quiz. So I guess we can we will meet again. Uh, and also I'm supporting the GNC, uh, the first of its kind that will be held in Peshawar. Um, but uh, we can have a hybrid on on YouTube, so you can uh, on my Zoom. I will share the link in my Facebook page, so you can all just join the virtual platform very easily it will be very easy so again thank you very much for joining in and i hope to see you again for my next um webinar series uh, for my next webinar so thank you very much and have a wonderful rest of the day